We now have a presentation from Dr. Mandy Demestra. Um, I'll just give you a brief introduction. Um, she's currently a reader in reproductive immunology at the Royal Veterinary College, where she teaches reproductive biology and supports and mentors veterinary students undertaking research. She also leads a research team whose goal is to understand key mechanisms that permit normal growth and survival of the fetus and the pathologies that underlie pregnancy failure. Her team's research is currently funded by the Horse Race Betting Levy Board, by ourselves and by the Alborada <coughs> Trust, and the team has produced outstanding reproductive research, which has been published widely in numerous scientific and veterinary publications. The TBA first supported vital research into early pregnancy loss in the thoroughbred in 2013, when we committed funds to support Do Dr Belinda Rose for her, through her PhD, <coughs> during which, through collaborative work with reproductive vets, she developed a novel technique to examine failed pregnancies. This enabled the next phase of research recently completed by Mandy's team, which has examined the genetics of placentation and early pregnancy loss, which Mandy is going to speak to us about today. The TBA has committed further funds to support two pieces of research led by Mandy due to commence in the coming months the first focusing on the development of a non-invasive genetic test to assess fetal health in the pregnant mare, and the second to look at the genetics of congenital muscular skeletal disorders in young thoroughbreds. Mandy will sadly be leaving the RVC to take up a full-time research post at Cornell University in the United States next year, but these TBA-sponsored projects will continue here in the UK as collaborative projects closely supervised by Mandy with our veterinary practices and stub farms. <laughs> the move to Cornell is an exciting opportunity for Mandy and her family. We wish them well and look forward to continuing to work together and benefit from her efforts. I'd like to um, invite Dr. Mandy Demestra to, to come and present. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very you. much, Thank Claire, you. for the, the very generous introduction. Um, it's really wonderful to be here today, and um, I'll move forward and share some of our results from the TBA-funded projects. I really feel though this is very much a industry sort of contributed project. We work very much with your horses, your mares, um, your foals, and so what I will present with you today really comes down to engagement by TBA members at, across the UK and also your veterinary surgeons who have really worked very closely with us over many years. Um, so I'm going to really think about the genetics of early pregnancy loss, and that's what I'll, I'll focus on. And a lot of people, when we started this out, was thinking, oh, is it just bad luck? Is this something we can do something about? And I hope by the end of today, I'll share some data with you that it isn't just bad luck. There are some interventions that you can do as breeders and management changes, and things you can do also to think about um, reproductive efficiency. So from a financial point of view, what is the best decision in your breeding mares to, to make it economically viable to manage them? Now, before, quickly before I move on to data, these are sort of all the people involved in the work. This is very much a collaborative effort. Moving on. So um, as well as supporting the research, you support the development of many trainees. And um, we heard earlier about Belinda Rose, who started um, work on this project. And then more recently, this is Charlotte Shilton, very excited getting her PhD here. So the work also has impact on bringing people into research in the industry. But really, what's our sort of shared goal here as breeders and researchers? And I think I think focus on this. This is what we want, a full program for optimal lifelong health and performance. So that's where we're all trying to head to. And actually, this is a my dibbling in, in breeding a couple of years ago. Was, this was one of my foals. Um, and I can put my hand up and say we have experienced abortions and early pregnancy loss in my sort of two mares. So I, I feel you're your pain. But what's going to prevent that? And that's really what we're trying to do here. And there are a number of things that can, can prevent this along the way. It's early pregnancy loss, you've got abortion and stillbirth. And then you've also got congenital sort of conditions that will really have an origin in, in fetal life. So what I'm going to focus on today is the work we've done on the early pregnancy loss. And this is what your vets will often present. You have your mare in the stocks or in the stable. You will scan a, a pregnancy which is there at 13 days and then a few weeks later you go and scan it and it's either gone or it's collapsing. And what we found out is 
generally, we don't know. When we started this work, you could probably say in 80% cases, we didn't know what that is. So it was really hard to tangibly try and work on this. What we did know is that this first two months of, of fetal life is incredible in, in so far as this is when that fetus goes from being a ball of cells shortly after fertilization to very intricate structure. You can see some of these pictures here as early as 42 days, its limbs are formed, all its organs are formed. And so that requires a lot of precision. And you can understand now maybe why we think the genetics have to be really tightly controlled. Um, there would be a long list you might read in a textbook, but this is some data here of us quantifying sort of early on. Uh, yeah, there we go. Quantifying early on. This is mares here in the UK, thoroughbred breeding mares, and we looked at the, the causes of those pregnancy losses. And what we found looking through detailed records is in 80% of the cases we didn't know. So that really bore our first question, and we wanted to know, well, could there be genetic reasons for this? Because there was a lot more done on the endometrium. We knew a bit about that, but what about the genetics? So this brings the aim to the TBA funded project to identify what we call genetic variants or genetic characteristics, which are associated with early pregnancy loss. So um, why look at the genetics? Um, well, this is a picture. This is the timing was back in, gosh, what have I done? Here we go. The timing is, this is, this is a horse called Twilight, and she had her genome. This is the first horse that was had its genome sequenced in 2008. So this is really why genetics is taking off over the last sort of 15 years or so. And just swinging back to uh, our very considered introduction earlier by Julian, um, it, you probably would be interested to hear that the that Queen Elizabeth II actually invited a horse geneticist to sit with her at lunch at Windsor Castle this year in June around Ascot. It was a colleague of mine um, from Cornell that uh, attended this, and he said she was incredible in her questioning of genetics. He was really on his toes, um, both in her intense interest in horse genetics and, and learning more about it. And this is something I think that really is going to be more and more in, in our future. But what we took for, for our project is thinking about data that had been obtained in women. And we know in women that genetic causes of pregnancy loss are pretty common. They're probably the most common reason they fail. So we thought we'd better look at it from the mare. So this is, I've just put this in. What are we looking at? What genetics of what? Um, and this is an important sort of defining part of this project, which I want to, wanted to sort of introduce you to. You could think about the genetics of the mare and stallion. And this is what you all do when making breeding choices and trying to get that perfect offspring. And indeed, when we think of, of pregnancy, the genetics of the mare is important as that nurturer of that fetus and supporting that fetus during development. Um, but the other way to look at it is actually the genetics of that, this actual offspring. So the genetics of the fetus here that's developing and the placenta around it. And the type of genetics we were first interested in is what we call lethal. So when this, genet this genetic characteristic will not allow progression of that pregnancy to birth. Um, it's a, a, what we call a lethal characteristic. So that's what we've been working on. Um, so you can see here, this is just a bit of an introduction just to put in context the types of things that we've been looking at. Um, you can see here the cell with the, the nucleus that contains the genetic material. And we've looked at all sorts of genetic characteristics. Um, so if you look up here, this is your chromosomes here. You can see, and we have a pair, we have 31 pairs of chromosomes in the horse plus the X and Y. And so we can look at characteristics right from this very sort of higher level where we can count the number of chromosomes in the cells. And then you can see as this chromosome unravels here, we can get down all the way to the detail down here where we can look at specific codes, <coughs> the base pairs. Um, there are four base pairs that contribute to the code of the genome here, and you can look at those individual ones and changes in those. In those. So we predicted that genetic changes right up at the chromosome level here, all the way down to involving these, thing, these changes here called copy number variants, I'll talk to you about in a minute, which are little parts of multiple chromosomes, all the way down to single changes here in base pairs can all impact pregnancy outcomes. Okay, so that's sort of the journey we've been taking here and um, we will continue to do as we move forward. <clears throat> so 
So the first um, thing we looked at was at, at the whole chromosomes. And so this is our first result. And what we found was indeed an abnormal number of chromosomes um, in these pregnancies led to early pregnancy loss. So it was not viable with pregnancy. So let me show you what this means. So you've got here in the middle, if you look in the middle here, there are 31 pairs of chromosomes plus your X and Y chromosome here. And we tested pregnancy losses from, from mares across the UK, thoroughbred mares, and then we looked at the genetics of these losses and we found that 22% of them actually had an abnormal total number of chromosomes. And so what, you might ask, what happens when you get an abnormal number of chromosomes? Well, this is a code, like a, a code for life. And so what can happen is you completely disrupt that code. So by putting in an extra chromosome, um, the way that the body develops, the fetus develops, is different because it's receiving a different code from that genome by the extra copy. If you lose a whole chromosome, so you can see this is an example here where we've got three copies of the first chromosome. If we lose a whole copy, so we only end off with one copy of the chromosome, similarly, we completely disrupt development. So you can see we most commonly found three copies of a, of a chromosome like this, so an extra copy, but we also found examples where they had lost it. So this is the most common cause of early pregnancy loss um, described to date. And we know it's primarily in early pregnancy because we've gone on and looked at other stages here. So you can see here across the top, this is early pregnancy, so up to two months of gestation of pregnancy here. Um, and you can see this is an abnormal number of chromosomes. This is just the chromosomes 1 to 31. You can see if you look down here, there are 15 of these out of the 73 that we've tested to date. Um, if we look down here, if we go through the literature of all horses of any breed over sort of decades now, there are about 13 described across any horse. And these are generally ones that have been identified early, like in yearlings, foals and yearlings, and they have developmental defects. So it can be consistent with life, but it's extremely, extremely rare. Also of note, work done um, as part of an HPLB funded study is we have identified these attributed to abortion and stillbirth as well, but it's significantly less common. So these are going to be mostly related to pregnancy loss. So just turn away if you don't like looking at these pictures, but I really felt like it's important to show you, you I talk about genes and that's sort of something you can think about, but actually what happens to the pregnancy? So if they lose a chromosome, as you can see here on the left, this, what happens is the embryo doesn't actually form. So there's no fetus there. You've just had like this placental sac. And so this is an example of what can happen if you lose a, lose a chromosome. This is an example. This is at 60 days. So this is two months into pregnancy. And this is a lost chromosome again. And you can see here what happens is that the vascular system hasn't formed normally. So it's quite red and, and edematous. So this change in the chromosomes does lead to very specific changes in the developing pregnancy, which is not compatible with, with ongoing life. So when would you expect a mare to lose it? Um, well, we have tested um, mares from around 15 days up to 65 days in that early pregnancy, and they can lose them all throughout. Um, but we probably bias our populations to more sort of 30, 35 days, so you're later scans in early pregnancy rather than your 21-day scan. But we also think that this is likely to attribute to the ones that fail to conceive. So when you scan your mares at 15 days and they haven't conceived a pregnancy and, and you, they're empty, there are two things that could have happened. Either fertilization didn't occur after cover, but it could have actually occurred, but then that pregnancy was lost very soon after, so in very early stages of development. And we think, based on other species and our work done to date, that there's likely quite a few in that group as well that are failing to conceive that are probably these amatory pregnancies. We're going to be looking at that in the future. Now, it's mares of all ages. As you know yourself, as mares get older, they have um, an increased risk of early pregnancy loss. But we didn't find this anaploidy just in, your, in older mares. It was actually also in some younger mares as well. So this is an only an older mare condition. So to try and manage this and think about what's going to go on next and how can you manage your mares differently if they have anaploid 
pregnancies. Well, where does it come from? And this is just to describe. There are two couple of places where it could come from, and I'm going to tell you where I think it does come from in the majority of cases. So it can be a, a defect that's acquired in the eggs. So this doesn't mean all eggs in that mare are aneuploid, but it does mean that some of them will, and that particular egg that fertilised carried an abnormal number of, of chromosomes. And this is particularly important in older mares. So this is work done by someone else. So you can see maternal age um, under 14 and over 16. And the number of eggs that have an abnormal number of chromosomes is well over double here. And so based on the work we've done as well, which I won't go into the details today, we think the most, the most common place this is coming from is probably through that particular egg that was ovulated having an abnormal number of chromosomes. And I'll talk... It can also be coming through stallion sperm having an abnormal number of chromosomes, but we think this is relatively um, small in its contribution to the condition. It can also be acquired in early development. So after fertilization, you've got this massive development of those embryos, those cells. We think it's remarkable really to think, you know, the side for my freckle here is what's happening after fertilization, and then you get your 60 kilo fold and, and placenta at, at parturition. So we've got incredible cell division and, and multiplication over that period. And that is going to be error prone. So it could be acquired in these very early stages. But our data to date still points towards this being the most common. So what can, what can we do? Why, why do we want to know this? Well, there are two things we can think about. One is, can we reduce the chance of this aneuploid happening? And so based on this, if you're trying to prevent reduce the number of those eggs having these abnormal number of chromosomes and that would be where we could target. Now actually this is starting to look like something we may be able to do in the, in the future, at least reduce them, not prevent them. So this is some work done very recently on mice. So this is mice, not mares, so I really need to, to point that out, but it's really interesting. So they've taken here aged mice in red and young mice here in blue and what they found is that they supplemented these mice with vitamin B3, um, and this is nicotinic acid or nicotinamine, they could actually reduce the number of eggs those mice had that had abnormal number of chromosomes. So this is supplementation <coughs> with, with vitamin B3. What about the mare? Well, we don't know much about this vitamin in the mare, and that's what we need to do a lot of in the future to see if this is something that would be feasible and viable, but it seems like something that certainly is very feasible from a breeder's perspective is to think about vitamin supplementation and, and optimizing that. Um, but a paper's just come out that is at least shown that if you supplement mares with this nicotinic acid, this vitamin B3, um, for three, a minimum of three consecutive days, they were able to measure this vitamin in the fluid that surrounds the egg. So you can give this vitamin to mares and it will get in to the fluid around the egg. So that's a really great first step. And I think that tells us we need to start to look at the effects of this in the future and see if we can use this as a, a way to minimize those aneuploidy. The other way to think about these two, which I'll come back to at the end, is thinking about how we predict these occurring. And um, I'm gonna hold that thought for a bit later after I've done a few more of these slides. So the second thing we looked at going along is not whole chromosomes. What happens if you have little segments of multiple chromosomes affected? So they're either lost or gained, but small parts of multiple chromosomes. Now, this is a genetic condition called copy number variation, or CNV, so copy number variation. So you can see here, if you look here, this is two chromosomes here. And if you look carefully at segment B, this is an example where that segment has been lost. And this is an example... Um, with the segment, um, sorry, not B, C. This is an example with C, the segment's been lost, and this is where it's been acquired. So you've got two copies of C, okay? So this is what we call copy number variation, lots of small parts of the chromosome lost or gained. Now, this is going to be different in all of us here today. This is a normal sort of source of genetic variation between individuals. But we also knew from reading the literature it also can increase the risk of certain diseases. And one thing that I find really interesting studying pregnancy in the placenta is the placenta is a bit like a tumour, a cancer. If you think about how quickly cancer cells can grow, it's a, that's what the placenta and the fetus has to do, grow really, really quickly. 
And this is a this the copy number variation is a phenomenon of cancer. So that that was another sort of interesting evidence for us to look at. Um, and we knew from studies in women that there were 11 studies describing these copy number variations associated with risk powers in stillbirth in, in women. So what we did is we quantified the part of the genome, so the proportion of the horse's genome when it's lost, that had this copy number variation. And what we found is actually similar to the aneuploidy, we found widespread copy number variation involving lots of chromosomes which would have the same disruption to development as having a, a, an extra copy of a chromosome. So, and this involved about 10% of the early pregnancy loss samples we looked at. So about 10%, one in 10 of the early pregnancy losses out there were found to have this sort of widespread disruption across multiple chromosomes. The other thing we found is that if you have such smaller segments, either deleted or duplicated, if they occur right where your important gene is, um, that could actually affect the function of that gene if it's important in development and therefore development. Um, so you could think of this on a performance level as well if you a key muscle gene that was subject to this could actually affect performance as well. So any sort of genetic change will affect the action of, of the gene. So what we found here is an example of a gene that was um, deleted, had a copy number variation, a deletion on a chromosome that involved a key gene involved in development of the central nervous system. And um, what we linked that to then here is this is a, a fetus here. This is a failure of the neural tube to close. So essentially one of the key stages in development and any sort of women or, or men that have accompanied women to scans um, that have had children, one of the things they look at in women is the neural tube and its development. And what we found here is that neural tube in pregnancy loss of the mare similar to what is seen in women, has a defect where it hasn't closed or formed normally, and this can be attributed to this genetic change. So moving on now to the third question we were looking at, and that is around inbreeding. And we heard a little bit of this earlier, and, and I think it's often a, a, an area of interest for the wider industry across all sorts of outcomes. We thought we would look at it specifically for early pregnancy loss. It's really important to note that all I'm looking at here is the link between inbreeding and specifically early pregnancy loss, no other phenotype. So we wanted to compare the, the genetic coefficient, so the inbreeding coefficient that we measure between the early pregnancy loss and normal viable adults. So why would this be important to do? Well, as you know, inbreeding increases what we call the homozygosity of the genome, so the similarity of the genome on both copies from mother and father, and that we know can decrease the fitness of the population. But what we do is we measure it here by measuring what's called runs of homozygosity. So the genome that is similar on both copies, how long are those runs? And this gives you this thing called a inbreeding coefficient. And really the take home here is actually we found no increase in inbreeding in the early pregnancy loss samples compared to the viable adults. So we couldn't find within our population, at least at the moment, that inbreeding was connected with early pregnancy loss as an outcome. Um, it's not to say it's not linked to other outcomes that have been shown in other breeds um, and it wouldn't happen in the future, but certainly at the current place, that's not a, a reason. Um, it doesn't mean inbreeding is good, so just keep that, keep that in mind. But what it does tell us is maybe we need to look more specifically at those single base place pair changes, so like these little single changes in the genome that can happen that could be deleterious for the development of that foal you're trying to produce. And so that's where we're focusing our work now. So we know already that single base pair changes to genome can be lethal, okay? And then there was this first case this year of a condition called fragile foal syndrome that's now been identified in a thoroughbred where there is a single point mutation, a change in a single gene that can lead to abortion and stillbirth, um, where one copy is inherited from the stallion and one from the mare. So our next steps is to see if we can find other examples of these single base pair changes so you can then plan your mating. And you know the, the good thing about these types is actually they're things you can prevent. So and 
what's really important when we talk about these single base pair changes, and, it, and, it, and particularly just to highlight prod as well, prod one, because I know it can be a little bit controversial at times, but we are likely to have lots of point mutations across your genomes, all of us, that will be lethal when combined together. So it's really important as an industry, I feel, that we don't think of these as good and bad horses or good and bad genes, because if we, for example, prevented all breeding from prod one carriers, as a per simple example, we could then inadvertently start breeding for something else that's, that's lethal. So as a, an industry, we need to be clever about how we go about this and think holistically about what needs to be done. The good thing is though they can be prevented, so we have to be thinking carefully about who we mate, because we know if we mate certain combinations, that could lead to lethality, and this is a pretty awful condition to get. Um, and if you can predict that with early pregnancy loss, you can choose your matings to make sure you have a good chance that that early pregnancy loss won't take place, and that's sort of the future on that area of our work. So just to summarise where we've got to, um, we started out here where we sort of didn't know too much about the causes, and I think we've started to tap away here and understand some significant contributors to early pregnancy loss. So not only do we have the sort of endometritis and, and endometrial changes, we've got the aneuploidies here as the most significant contributor, along with some of these other copy number variation changes. And we're likely to follow with some of these single base pair changes, we hope, in, in the future. But to come back again, because this has to be relevant for you out on the farms, what are you going to do differently? And the first thing I think to, to point out is it's really important to know why your mare loses the, the pregnancy because it can really allow your veterinarian to target the treatment and you to save costs. So for example, if we assume most mares are losing their pregnancy because of endometrial damage, you will be often treating for endometrial disease and when these mares lose, lose their pregnancy. But we now know actually it's much more likely as a, one of these <coughs> genetic reasons so we need to think in a more targeted way which mares need those endometrial treatments. So I really need to give it to her. Um, and your veterinary surgeon is by far the best person placed to, to decide that by looking at endometrial disease, for example. But keep in mind, it's more likely to be one of these genetic conditions, in which case you don't need to treat for endometrial disease if it's not there. Um, so it ensures also by diagnosing it, we can then ensure that they're not carrying these pregnancies to the future. So if you say, for example, supplement with progesterone, a mare that's going to eventually lose this pregnancy anyway, you're just going to prolong that pregnancy and then have it get lost later. So we're much better to know early on not to prolong the pregnancies that we know are, are lethal. It also, as I said, reduces these um, costs associated with treating these if it's not for the right reasons. It reduces our use of antimicrobials, which are more and more tightly regulated. Um, and in the future, we hope to be able to help guide these mating decisions to try and reduce your risk as well. So I just thought I'd finish up just for the last sort of, sort of two slides, looking to the future. And these are the two projects that are co-funded um, by the TBA, for which we're incredibly uh, appreciative of ongoing support and look forward to working with many people here um, on this in the future. And I'd really invite sort of breeders here, if you're interested in working with us, please do, do get in touch with me because we'd be delighted to um, continue and make it relevant to, to your mares as well. Um, so one of the limitations I just highlighted about finding these genetic characteristics in early pregnancy loss is at the moment what happens is your mare loses the pregnancy, the vet flushes out that embryo, sends it to the lab, and then we can retrospectively diagnose why that pregnancy was lost. Because we can look at the genetics and say, yes, we found this abnormal problem of chromosomes, and so they use that information to manage the mare. And that is definitely useful. It's part of their toolbox, and they'll be able to use that to manage that mare in the future. But it'd be much better to know whether we could diagnose at the time while she's still pregnant or starting to look like she had something abnormal on the findings on the ultrasound, whether that was abnormal or not. And that is the goal of this particular future project, is to develop a test, a diagnostic test. It's non-invasive, so it would be using a blood sample to predict whether the fetus that that mare is carrying has these genetic 
um, challenges that would be incompatible with life, so that that would allow it to eventually be lost. So it's a single non-invasive diagnostic test. Now, that would mean you could take a blood sample and um, um, from that mare and count the number of chromosomes, but we could, if we find lethal variants, so other things that cause losses later on, we could measure those. So it's based off a test in women called NIPTI, non-invasive prenatal testing. And this is from St. George's in London. And the placenta here attaches to the, to the um, in the case of the mare and women, attaches to the um, uterus here. And then you can see what happens is the DNA is excreted primarily off the placenta, not necessarily from the, the fetus itself, into the mother's bloodstream. So we would be taking a sample of this blood, isolating the DNA that's specifically coming from the fetus and being able to test that. And we've just started some preliminary studies um, on that now and are really looking forward to getting going with that and hopefully reporting in a few years' time on how you can apply that in practice. Um, just very briefly, so I probably running out of time, but to, to briefly finish up too, the second project we're looking at um, relates to congenital conditions. And this really, um, what we started thinking when we're moving towards this position over here, this optimal health, is one of the most common reasons for a vet to come to see a, a foal in, in early life will be these congenital developmental orthopedic conditions. Um, so this is angular limb deformities, contractures, and actually Rebecca Muncy, who's at the RBC, she went through some records of causes of foal deaths in thoroughbreds specifically, and the most common reason was these congenital musculoskeletal diseases. So their origins, though, are going to be in fetal life. And so there are two things we're going to be looking at. One is the environment, so the exposures of the mare, so what she's exposed to in, in life as well, and then the genetics of that fetus that might lead to it being lost. So here we go. The aim is to investigate the contributions of exposures during pregnancy. So this might be her nutrition, what's optimal nutrition, um, other sort of toxins that might be in the environment that will increase the risk of these conformational abnormalities. And the other thing we're going to look at is the genetics. So this here is a, a, a fetus very early on, but you can see here the limbs have already formed around 35 days. So these types of variants that we found that caused early pregnancy loss, you could imagine if they occurred in other parts of the genome, so in other areas with genes that are involved in forming the limbs, we might start to see early um, developmental problems originating here. And that's what we're going to be looking for with a hope that we could again avoid certain combinations that would lead to a successful and, and outcome and a more viable foal. So thank you very much for having me here today and the funding from the TBA. We're really delighted to be working with you again. And as always, I'm very happy to take questions today or emails at any point um, as well. So thank you for your attention. very much Mandy. Do you want to just stay there for a couple of minutes and like to open up to any questions for Mandy first from the floor. Um, we have a number of um, arms going up and we do have a microphone and for the purposes of recording this meeting we do need to, you to identify your name and um, speak into the microphone. So we've got I think Colin first, Colin Bryce. Yeah Colin Bryce, TBA trustee. Um, you're looking at the causal factors for early pregnancy loss. Do some of these causal factors potentially um, uh, cause later pregnancy loss as well? Yeah, so we, that's, we've just started to look at that and we've got a bank of abortion samples. Um, we have looked at the aneuploidy, the abnormal number of chromosomes, and we definitely find that to be a cause of late pregnancy loss. What you tend to find, which I didn't really go into, is depends on whether you have a big chromosome affected or a small one or part of a big one. So you can imagine if you have a really big chromosome affected, you're more likely to disrupt development earlier. And that's where we get early pregnancy loss. When we look at our smaller chromosomes or a part of a big chromosome, that's when we tend to get abortion. So there's a link as to which chromosome is affected when it occurs. Yeah. Yeah. Towards the back there, please. 
I'm Dr. Jean Brooks, and I have a lot to do with the University of Oxford. I mean, in a human being, we can genetically modify the breaks in the chains of the DNA, mm. but would this ever be allowed in a horse? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we heard earlier, but we're not, we're not going to. So you could try and, what we can do in the horse, we can't specifically go in and change those breaks under, well, not in the thoroughbred, when the regulations at the moment, people are looking at that technology in horses. No one has ever done, say, you might be thinking of CRISPR, which is a technology. So essentially for others, CRISPR is a technology where you can change a single base pair in a, in a genome um, and then look at the outcome. That's never been done successfully in a horse that I'm aware of. Um, I know, well, well that's, <laughs> that's one of my plans at Cornell actually is because that we'll be able to see if we can we can do that as a proven principle. The reason for doing that, just to say it's not just because you want to change that base pair and have a offspring, but we can actually learn about how important these genes are. So if I say to you there's a base pair that's causing early pregnancy loss, it's really nice I can go in and prove it by making that base pair change and then showing the mares will lose that pregnancy. So it can be applied in both investigating, um, obviously in some industries as well, but certainly what we're focusing on is the work coming out of women looking at um, nutrition and very um, environmental exposures that could reduce the the origins of this anarchy, and I think that's where we can help the horse. Sorry? Yeah, it could be genetics. And the other thing we, we would like to do when we get our sample bank up is you could look at the origins of the um, aneuploidy, so there might be certain sort of other genetic interactions that could cause the problem. Yes, Brian. Uh, <clears throat> Brian Mayo, TVA trustee until the end of this meeting and reading. <laughs> uh, at what age of the conceptus do you envisage that t DNA testing of the mer will show the danger of early pregnancy loss? Mm -hmm. How many days? So we need to, that's what we're doing as the first step in the next grant is to be able to do that. What we know is that, you know, when the endometrial cups form, for example, we know the mare makes antibodies to those cups. And so we know that the fetus has signaled the mother. And so by that time, we should be able to also find fetal DNA. So around the time of when those endometrial cups form, which is around six weeks or so. I guess we, the key question then is, if you then abort uh, a conception that's mm -hmm. going to go wrong, is it too late to get repeat made? So that will be a challenge if we bought it at the 42 days. Yeah, that's what I, I mean, that's what we need to find out. Yeah. But. Um, there, there's a couple of things. There's a lot of work going on about trying to accelerate the death of the endometrial cups. So that's sort of ongoing by, by groups at the moment. I know there's some work being done over in Lexington on that using various stimulants. So we're hoping as the science progresses side by side, we can address this holistically. But you're exactly right. That's, yeah. We have to be, it's a part of your toolbox. It's, none of these things are ever a golden bullet, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we don't know because we did that study out of a, um, with Rostow's laboratory, so we were blinded to a lot of the information from those, but now we've found those we need to go back in and start to look at that type of information. And one of the challenges is we need large numbers to make robust conclusions, so that's what we need to do moving forward is starting to collect that information. Good question, yeah. <laughs> Jess Westwood, new trustee. Um, a quick one regarding your non-pregnant mare. Can, can we, are you looking into the eggs? Are you flushing them to see those chromosomes issues, anything like that? Can, can we, as breeders, flush our mare and, and send you know, uh, samples off um, for chromosome problems at all? Does it have to be an embryo? Yeah, so as far as looking at the, at the mares, so we would need to be looking at the eggs to see what they are. The, one of the challenges of that approach is that we don't know when we sample those eggs, some of them could be anapoid and some of them not. And so it would require a lot of sampling to give an accurate sort of 
representation of that mayor's status. It's possible with a, uh, there's a procedure called ovum pickup where you can go in and take out the egg. So that's what you do. It's quite invasive, I would say. So we probably need a little bit more information to think whether we would use that diagnostically. We haven't started that, but we are just starting to go back and look at those mechanisms and that sort of there's some a number of groups at Cornell that one of the reasons I wanted to be there is working on mouse models of that where we can work with some of the, the systems that they've developed and start to look at some of these in the mayor as well. But we're not quite ready for you to sample your, your eggs yet. <laughs> Leslie McGrath, TBA member. Um, I just wondered if you'd done any research on um, mares losing pregnancies at 40 days when they've got a foal at foot. When, when they haven't got a foal at foot, they're fine, but it's just when they have a foal at foot. So, yeah, so some, this will be a mixed population, um, although most of them are foaling mares, I would say, that we have had seen as aneuploidian. So it is mixed as an occasional maiden mare that suffered these genetic conditions, but a lot of these will be foaling mares that we've identified these sort of genetic changes. We haven't looked specifically at foaling and genetics, which is your question, I think. Like what? But the fact our, most of our population is foaling mares that we've got amongst here. So that's a good question, whether it's maiden or not. There is certainly one thing that we were surprised by here with the aneuploidy, is sometimes the really young mares were getting it as well, like the three-year-olds. I don't know if you noticed that. We were really surprised by that. But when we went back into the literature, we found in human teenage pregnancy, they have a much higher rate of miscarriage associated with these similar genetic conditions. And it's to do with the endocrine system, the priming of, of the ovary. And so we need to look into more detail to be able to answer your question about whether the falling mares are unique and how they differ. There could be something. Mandy. No, but I think hopefully Mandy you'll be joining us for lunch, lunch today yes, yeah. so can pick up the conversations with her and if you've got anything I'm sure you'll be thank happy to answer. Thank you very well, much. No, Mandy. Thank Absolutely you all for having me.